to part one. Part one. You will hear a science student inquiring about English courses at a university language centre. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 1 to 7. Hi, I've come to ask about the English courses you run for international students. Oh, right. I assume you're a student at the university. Yes, I've just started. Okay, well, we've got a range of courses. It depends what you think you need and how much. Oh. Um, we can't run everything at the same time, though. So, for example, in this first term, we are just doing a writing course. I see. That sounds quite useful. What else is there? Um, some of the courses only run for single terms, and we tend to focus on what students have difficulty with. That means we don't usually do speaking courses, but next term you can do listening. Oh. That'll help you with lectures and things. Our provision is all based on what the majority of our international students need. So, is everything term-based? There's nothing that you run all year? Well, let's have a look. Yes, there is a class for vocabulary and grammar every term. That's for everybody, but it's split into three or four levels. And what about in the holidays? We don't do anything during the winter or spring break. Yes. But over the summer, there's just general classes because that's what most students want. Mm. A bit of everything. Mm -hmm. Okay, quite a variety then. Mm. I'll uh, have a think about what I really need, because I haven't got much time. Do you have about 20 students in each class, the same as our science seminars? We try to keep it at about 12, and certainly not more than 15. Mm -hmm. It's important for language classes. They're very different from your normal courses. Right. And how much are the classes? The rate varies depending on how many hours you attend, but you shouldn't have to pay. Usually, the department will fund you and even sort out which classes you need. Oh, brilliant. Hmm. It would be quite useful for me to have a certificate to take back to my country. Do you put us in for exams? Yes, but we don't like them to clash with your main course exams in June, so we run them in May. Oh. That leaves you time for revision. Do I have to sign up for something now? I'm not quite sure what I want. Classes haven't quite started yet, so you've got time to decide what you do. All we insist is that you sign up before week five. That gives you about three weeks to decide. OK. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 8 to 10. Then, when you've made up your mind, you need to come back here to the administration office to enroll. What do I need to bring with me when I enroll? My identity card, I guess? Yes, or your passport. Uh -huh. Then you'll be given a registration form, which you'll have to show to the teacher when you have your first class. OK. And um, should I ask my tutor about which classes I should do then? Yes. Then you get a note from him and give that to the desk when you register. Can I use the computers here as well? Yes. You'll be given a password when you go to your first class. So remember to bring a disk with you to save your work on, as you won't be allowed to save it on the hard drive. OK. Will I need anything else? Dictionary? We've got loads of those here that you can borrow. But you'll need a notebook, as we don't provide paper or files. OK. Thanks. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one.
Part 2 You will hear an introductory talk about a new agricultural park. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Welcome to Greenvale Agricultural Park. As you know, we've only been open a week, so you're amongst our first visitors. We have lots of fascinating indoor and outdoor exhibits on our huge complex, spreading hundreds of hectares. Our remit is to give educational opportunities to the wider public as well as to offer research sites for a wide variety of agriculturists and other scientists. Let's start by seeing what there is to do. As you can see uh, here on our giant wall plan, we are now situated in the reception block here. As you walk out of the main door into the park, there's a path you can follow. If you follow this route, you'll immediately come into the rare breeds section where we keep a wide variety of animals, which I shall be telling you a little more about later. Next to this, uh, moving east, is the large grazing area for the rare breeds. Uh, then further east, in the largest section of our park, is the forest area. Um, south of the grazing area, and in fact just next to the reception block, is our experimental crop area. In the middle of the park, uh, this circular area, is our lake. Uh, these two small rectangular shapes here are the fish farms where we rear fish for sale. To the east of those is the marsh area which attracts a great many migrant birds. Uh, in the southeastern corner beyond the marsh is our market garden area growing vegetables and flowers. Before you hear the rest of the talk you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. All these areas can be visited by the general public for almost all the year. Although, uh, please take note of the large signs at the entrance to each area which tell, uh, which tell you when certain areas are being used for particular controlled experiments and are therefore temporarily out of bounds to the public. You can see for yourself what a huge area the park covers and a key question is always, how can we move around? Well, you have a choice of means, all environmentally friendly. Um, cars are banned in the park. We have bicycles, which you can hire behind the reception block here. Uh, the healthy ones of you can go on foot. And finally, there's our electric tram powered from solar cells. You find more information about this at the front entrance. A good place to start on your tour is the rare breed section. We keep goats, sheep and hens and other kinds of poultry. We're also thinking of bringing in cows and horses, but we do not as yet have facilities for these bigger animals. The animals are fed in public twice a day and a short lecture given on their feeding habits and nutritional needs. These are very popular with the public, but... Uh, of course, you mustn't lose sight of the main purpose of having this section, not as such to preserve rare animals, but to maintain the diversity of breeds, to, to broaden the gene pool for agricultural development. Greenvale changes with the seasons, with different events happening at different times of the year. 
May will be perhaps our most spectacular month with the arrival of the Canada geese and when our fruit trees will be in full blossom. But there are interesting events on all year round. Um, for example, John Havers, our expert fly fisherman, is currently giving displays on the lake. Each of the sections has its own seasonal calendar and please consult the summary board at the main entrance. And the final section as we return to the reception blocks, is the orchard. Do take time to browse round our shop. There's a wide selection of books on wildlife, some of them written by local authors, and the history of farming, including organic farming, something which the park will be diversifying into in the coming months. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two medical students, Caitlin and Hideki, discussing options for courses. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 21 to 23. Hi, Hideki. How are you? Fine. I'm glad I bumped into you. Have you got five minutes to sit down and discuss our extra course options for next term? Yes, yeah, sure. You mean the support courses for our modules? Yes. We've got three choices, and I'm not sure which would be best for us to do. Let's have a look. Um, yeah, we could do science and ethics. Sounds quite interesting. Yes. But I think we should be thinking what we get out of each course. Mm. So, science and ethics. There's a lot of reading and research to do. And I don't think it comes up in the exams, does it? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, oh, I see we have to do assignments and we get our score from that. But what it would do is to force us to get better at doing essays and reports. You know, organizing them and using the right kind of language. Mm. It might be worthwhile. Yeah, you're right. An alternative is the pharmacology prelim course. Oh. I think it's in case we want to go on to transfer to pharmacology at the end of the year, because lots of students do. Mm -hmm. So it depends what we want to do in the future. But apparently, they send you off to find out about various companies and the differences between their products. It would give you lots of practice in investigative studies and analysis. I think I'd quite enjoy that. Yes, I see your point. Um, then the other option is reporting test results. Sounds a bit boring. Not sure why they have a separate course just for that. Well, I could certainly do with some help in that. Because if you go out into industry, that's what you'll spend most of your time doing. Mm. So it's got a very practical application. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to go for pharmacology. Me too. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 24 to 30. So, let's have a look at it in more detail. Oh, goodness. If we do pharmacology, then we have to do a supplementary maths course. Oh, no, that's not fair. Mm. Mind you, I think I need it. <laughs> Does that mean we have twice as many lectures? No. This maths is only a short course. The chemistry department are responsible, and they do it in the third term. 
So we've got all next term to settle into the pharmacology bit. Oh, I find the tutor makes a real difference. Some of them make chemistry so easy, and some of them I can't understand at all. Like that one we had from Oxford University? Oh. <laughs> Mind you, the one on this course should make sense because he's a lecturer who's coming in for a few weeks from industry. So at least it'll be linked to the real world. <laughs> yeah. The project we have to do on this pharmacology course is huge and it doesn't give us much time. We have to make a decision about what we want to do on the project as soon as we start in January and then hand in our plans before the end of the month. Doesn't give us much time to sort out what's possible or not. Mm. I mean, doesn't the scale of our project depend on what resources we can have? Like, what equipment we can use? I suppose so, though I think there's plenty available. For example, it says that if we need to do any experiments, then we can use all the equipment in the new lab, as long as we book it. Oh, okay. It's slowly beginning to take shape for me. I think it'll be a good course. I'm just worried that I get enough support to do it. Oh, I think you'll be okay. And the tutors are always available if you get stuck. Oh, actually, it says that if you're not sure, then in December, they'll be running one or two additional seminars. So I might go to those. Actually, what's quite interesting is that at the end of the course, when our project is completed, then we have to do a presentation on it. Oh. I think that's quite good practice. Oh, a bit scary, though. <laughs> Well, it shouldn't be too bad, as they say that we can do it in pairs. Oh. Spread the load, as it were. <laughs> oh, good. I have done presentations before, but I'm always very nervous. And is the presentation what we're assessed on, then? Let me look. Um... Ah, it says that we have an interview and we get a mark for the whole course, depending on how well we do in that. Oh, right. OK. So I... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear a student giving a presentation about a project on household waste recycling. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, my group has been doing a project on how household waste is recycled in Britain. We were quite shocked to discover that only 9% of people here in the UK make an effort to recycle their household waste. This is a lower figure than in most other European countries and needs to increase dramatically in the next few years if the government is going to meet its recycling targets. The agreed targets for the UK mean that by 2008 we must reduce our carbon dioxide emissions by 12.5% compared with 1990. And recycling can help to achieve that goal in two main ways. The production of recycled glass and paper uses much less energy than producing them from virgin materials. And also, recycling reduces greenhouse gas emissions from landfill sites and incineration plants. As part of our project, we carried out a survey of people in the street. And the thing that came up over and over again 
is that people don't think it's easy enough to recycle their waste. One problem is that there aren't enough drop-off sites, that is, the places where the public are supposed to take their waste. We also discovered that waste that's collected from householders is taken to places called bring banks for sorting and bailing into loads. One problem here is taking out everything that shouldn't have been placed in the recycling containers. People put all sorts of things into bottle banks, like plastic bags and even broken umbrellas. All this has to be removed by hand. Another difficulty is that toughened glass used for cooking doesn't fully melt at the temperature required for other glass, and so that also has to be by hand. Glass is easy to recycle because it can be reused over and over again without becoming weaker. Two million tons of glass is thrown away each year. That is, seven billion bottles and jars. But only 500,000 tons of that is collected and recycled. Oddly enough, half the glass that's collected is green, and a lot of that is imported, so more green glass is recycled than the UK needs. As a result, new uses are being developed for recycled glass, particularly green glass, for example, in fiberglass manufacture and water filtration. A company called CLF Aggregates makes a product for roads, and 30% of the material is crushed glass. For recycling paper, Britain comes second and comes second in Europe with 40%, behind Germany's amazing 70%. When recycling started, there were quality problems, so it was difficult to use recycled paper in office printers, but these problems have now been solved. And Martins, based in South London, produces a range of office stationery which is 100% recycled, costs the same as normal paper, and is of equally high quality. But this high quality comes at a cost in terms of the waste produced during the process. Over a third of the waste paper that comes in can't be used in the recycled paper, leaving the question of what to do with it. One firm, PaperSave, currently sells this to farmers as a soil conditioner, though this practice will soon be banned because of transport costs and the smell, and the company is looking into the possibility of alternative uses. Plastic causes problems, because there are so many different types of plastic in use today, and each one has to be dealt with differently. Packrite recycles all sorts of things, from bottles to car bumpers, and one of its most successful activities is recycling plastic bottles to make containers which are used all over the country to collect waste. The Save a Cup scheme was set up by the vending and plastics industries to recycle as many as possible of the three and a half billion polystyrene cups used each year. At the moment, 500 million poly cups are collected, processed, and sold on to other businesses such as Waterford, which turns the cups into pencils, and Johnson & Jones, a Welch-based firm, which has developed a wide variety of items, including business cards. Well, to sum up, there seems to be plenty of research going on into how to use materials, but the biggest problem is getting people to think about recycling instead of throwing things away. At least doing the research made us much more careful. That is the end of Part 4. You now have one minute to check your answers to Part 4. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.
ever been baffled by Ilt's writing task 1, fear not. It's all about crafting a clear and concise overview. First, get familiar with the data. Identify the key trends, differences, or stages. Next, condense these points into two or three sentences. Avoid details. We're aiming for a bird's eye view. Remember, don't include every single change or trend. Focus on the most significant ones and avoid any personal opinion. Stick to the facts. What about language? Choose words that accurately depict changes or trends. Words like increase, decrease, fluctuate, or remain stable are golden. So, in a nutshell, know your data, condense the key points, and use accurate language. Eelts. Writing task 1. You've got this. Cue the clock. 60 seconds on Eelts. Speaking topic-based vocabulary, the quickfire guide. Part 1, often about familiar topics. Remember hobbies? It's not just painting or reading. Think calligraphy, numismatics, tarot reading. Part two, a bit more personal. Describing people, don't just say nice or kind. How about magnanimous, altruistic, gregarious? Finally, part three, the deep dive. Discussing societal issues, poverty is simple. Try economic disparity, systemic inequality, financial exclusion. Remember, variety is the spice of language. Let your vocabulary shine and you're one step closer to acing that ilt speaking test. TikTok, time's up. Stay tuned for more rapid-fire IELTS prep. Until next time, keep those vocab lists growing.